Hello and welcome back to Wine Reform. So I've got something really interesting to share today. Uh, it was given to me as a gift and I am so excited to open it. Today we will be trying St. Catherine Cellars lavender wine. Now this isn't like a wine made from like a lavender syrup or anything. This is a white wine that's been infused with lavender. St. Catherine Cellars is a winery in Colorado. It is in Palisade. Uh, Colorado is kind of um, I think it's like an up and coming wine country. I'm very excited to see where it goes, but there's a lot of small wineries doing interesting things and St. Catherine Cellars is one of them. So we have got lavender wine to try today, but first. So the first time that I actually came across herbed wine was when I was perusing the internet for some home wine making recipes. I was looking for some interesting sort of mom and pop-ish things to delve into. And I did find a recipe for herb organic herb infused wine on Frey Vineyards. Um, and the rest is history. <laughs> herb wine is actually not a new concept. The first concrete evidence of plant additives in wine came from 3150 BCE in Scorpion the First tomb in Abydos, Egypt. Um, this tomb was sort of a multi-roomed, um, almost like a necropolis, but not quite. There were quite a few tombs, but this is just one of them. Um, the physical evidence of herbs in wine actually helped supplement some unclear text on herb wine. Back in 1994, Dr. Patrick McGovern, who is the scientific director of Biomolecular Archaeology Project for Cuisine, Fermented Beverages, and Health at the Penn Museum, and a team of archaeologists, um, they sampled residue from one of the jars in Scorpion's tomb. Using Fourier Transform Infrared Spectroscopy, high performance liquid chromatography, and finally a Feigl spot test, they found significant samples of tartaric acid in the residue in these jars, thus confirming that this was holding wine. Um, now tartaric acid is one of the three key acids found primarily in wine, and especially in the ancient world, the greatest concentration of it would be found in pretty much just wine, so this is a very significant discovery. So other HPLC data showed that not only was there wine in these jars, there was, there was also tree resins. Now in this region it would have been the terebinth tree resin, however other resins can be used. Uh, further study into jars at the same site using headspace solid phase micro extraction and Thermal desorption GCMS analysis <laughs> showed Saturia, uh, which is related to rosemary and thyme, uh, Artemisia sabeni, a plant related to wormwood and mugwort, and blue tansy were also in the wine. Now, the resins and the herbs in these wines were actually really important and they weren't just for taste. Although there are some regions that nowadays will still traditionally add resins to their wines, but we're not gonna talk about that today, but I will drop a link. Tree resins have antimicrobial properties, which means that they can actually help prevent a wine from spoiling or turning into vinegar. There is evidence of tree resins being used for similar purposes all throughout the ancient Middle East and the Mediterranean, as well as in the Yellow River Valley in China for similar fermented beverages around 7,000 BCE. And the herbs? Also not just for taste, they were actually being dispensed as medicine through the wine. This physical evidence is supported by papyri on pharmacovia from ancient Egypt describing over a thousand plants as well as their medicinal properties. Also describing formulations of wine and herbs being administered as prescription medication. So my mind was blown. Um, I'm just gonna say I now <laughs> I thoroughly admire Dr. Patrick McGovern and his work, and I will be coming back to it, so be prepared for that. Anywho, further scouring the internet showed me lots of recipes for herb wine touting their taste and their health benefits. Beyond the ancient Egyptian herb wine, I have found lots and lots of wine elixir recipes, and one of the most cited herbalists actually being St. Hildegard von Bingen of the 10th century. Um, very fascinating. She kind of said that herbs were God's gift to humanity, and she wanted to show people how to use them, so there's a lot of really interesting herbed wines from her. 
So at this point, I was pretty much hooked. I really wanted to try this naturopathic drink. I thought it would be a really interesting way to try to connect with history, as well as maybe just discover something new in the process. Hence the lavender white wine. I am more familiar with lavender versus other herbs because not only does it smell amazing, it helps bring calm and sleep, do things I desperately need. <laughs> Um, but little did I know, a lot of people use lavender for other purposes, such as easing nausea, alleviating headaches, and helping to get rid of acne. Um, while I am all for homeopathic remedies, I will, disclaimer, I do not consider them superior to hard medicine. Um, they're good to supplement, but not to replace. Uh, however, I will drop a link with some interesting research about lavender and its effect on the nervous system. Lavender. So it actually comes from the Latin root word lavare, which means to wash. Um, in ancient Egypt, lavender was used as part of the mummification process, and in ancient Persia, Greece, and Rome, it was actually added to baths. Hilariously, we still add it to baths nowadays. If you're, you know, really into bath bombs or you appreciate aromatherapy in the shower, a lot of people will use lavender, lavender oils for those purposes. So humans have always been humans. So lavender is actually a plant which grows a lot better in slightly alkaline soil that drains well and gets a lot of direct sun. Um, because of this, it grows extremely well in the high desert. So St. Catherine Cellars is a Colorado winery. It is the high desert. Lavender grows best in the high desert. What a perfect mishmash of plant matter. Um, so why don't we go ahead and get it open? Something I do find kind of interesting is how herbed wine seems so strange, and yet I was thinking about other things I've done with wine. And one of those things I've done is actually a mold wine, which is just kind of heating up some red wine and adding mulling spices. So maybe this isn't that different, although I guess the, the process is different, but similar concept in my mind. Something to think about. So I've actually been to a lavender festival um, back in New Mexico and I found a lot of really interesting lavender products. I tried lavender ice cream, lavender shortbread, lavender lemonade, um, although I was not of age at the time so I didn't get to try any lavender wine. Um, although I think there's actually a lavender festival in Colorado so maybe I'll see if I can go give that a go. But yes, lavender is an extremely aromatic sort of uh, plant. It's beautiful, it looks kind of blue. So, you know, I'm, I'm expecting it to affect this wine heavily, so let's see what we get. All right, the first thing we do when evaluating wine is we look at it. Now I know this is an herbed wine, but I'm gonna give the same style of evaluation that I do for any wine, just for consistency's sake. And uh, we'll go ahead and start with the looks. So it is an extremely pale, very light bodied wine. Um, I have a feeling they probably used some sort of very light, light bodied grape. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if they used Riesling. That seems to be popular among Colorado vintners. Uh, I've heard a lot of them grow that. And um, so yes, it's very light bodied. Um, it is, it does have a slight pinkish color to it, which I assume is from the lavender. Um, and there's pretty much nothing floating in that wine. The clarity is awesome. It's just, yeah, it's, it's very pretty. It looks very nice. So as far as white wine goes, uh, this one's pretty pink, <laughs> which is interesting. I would have expected a bit more of a blue color, but what do I know? I didn't study chemistry. All right, so now that we have taken a look at our white wine and established it's got a very um, pinkish color, <laughs> we're gonna go ahead and give it a sniff. Usually with white wines, I expect a very light, sort of um, very subtle nose. However, because this is an herbed wine, I'm probably gonna get some pretty strong aroma, but let's give it a sniff. Okay, so yes, lavender, got that first, duh, lavender infused wine. Although, perhaps I might be right in that they used Riesling because I did get very classic Riesling qualities um, after I got past the aromatic lavender. I was definitely smelling honeysuckle, lav um, lemon, <laughs> lime, and some apricots. It was very uh, sweet, 
sort of stone fruit and citrus, which was a nice sort of balance to uh, come through after the lavender. I do think that it felt very rounded. It was a very nice bouquet. Um, and the intensity of that nose, yeah, because of, of that lavender, it was very intense. <laughs> um, this is certainly one of the most aromatic white wines I have ever given a sniff, but I don't know, it smells really good. I'm actually kind of intrigued, so I can't wait to try it. So we have just given it a whiff and a sniff, and now we get to do my favorite part, probably your favorite part too. We're gonna taste it and see if we can pick out anything else and maybe see if what we smell matches what we taste. So, cheers. Okay, so I tasted everything I smelled, which was awesome. It makes it very easy. Um, moving on, I could note that it had a kind of medium acidity. It was very uh, light on the tongue. The finish was medium. The alcohol felt medium. Yep, we're medium alcohol. We're at 12%. Um, and it was off dry. I do think that that little bit of sweetness uh, coming through on the tongue really did help balance out the aromatic lavender. Lavender can be very intense, so it was probably a good move on their part to keep it off dry if they were going to herb infuse it. Um, but it was really good. It was very balanced, and I really appreciated the sort of... Well, it, it was different, and I think that was fun. Because it is herbed, I will say trying to find, trying to think of specific things to pair with it is probably a little bit more difficult. Um, I obviously don't want to put this with something that is going to be sweeter. The wine should always be sweeter than the food. But trying to think of things that could work very well with lavender. Let me see. Well, I can't have grapefruit, but... Um, any sort of grapefruit salad, I think that this has enough sweetness that it would balance out that bite of acidity, so I can see that working. Um, if you are a fan of brie, a soft cheese, I think this would work pretty well with soft cheese. Um, just very light summer fare. If you are into maybe like lemon chicken, you like to do white fish with very uh, light herbs and lemon, I think that would work pretty well. I wouldn't pair it with too many desserts. I think the only dessert item I might pair this with would be a very savory biscuit. So like a shortbread cookie. Um, nothing sweeter than that though. I do think that that would overpower this and then this would taste too much like lavender and not enough like a wine. So I'd be careful about that. But all in all, it was really, really cool. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. Um, Herb infused wine, it just feels so gosh darn cottagecore. Like, I know we are approaching the end of summer, but I think that uh, an herb infused wine is a really great way to try and soak up that last bit of sun. I just, I can't picture this outside of a cottage-like setting. I'm just picturing this adorable little kitchen and a jar with herbs and wine in it. And it's just sitting there like, and you can see the wine extracting that color. It's just, that's what I picture right now. This is cottage core dreams right here. So if you have a chance to live that cottage core dream which i cannot i don't have a cottage then please live it for me let me know how it goes <laughs> um yeah it was just really cool this is really cool i'm very glad that i tried it i definitely do feel a little bit more connected to a specific part of history um or a couple of specific parts of history that being uh, the 10th century with saint hildegard von bingen and um the Geez, the early, early parts of the ancient Egyptian um, empire, if you will, with their herbed wines. Uh, now, I do not consider this medicinal. Um, it was delicious, but I'm not going to use it as medicine. I will say that. Please don't consider herbed wine medicine. Um, although I wish it could be. That would be very nice. But unfortunately, or fortunately rather, we have modern medicine, so we can turn to some slightly more... Um, guaranteed ways of dealing with our ailments. But if anything, I think an herbed wine is definitely fun to try. If you appreciate feeling a little bit more connected to history, maybe 
give it a go yourself. Get some wine, put some herbs in it, see what you think. And I'm probably gonna do that now. I do have actually quite the array of, I can show you. Some licorice root, got dried elderberry, which is pretty good. Um, got mugwort, use it sparingly, it's got a very distinct taste. Uh, chicory root, this one's kind of fun. So yeah, we can use herbs in a lot of things. Uh, herb wine, definitely not the first way I would have used herbs, but now that I know about it, maybe I will try and replicate one of the wines of the tombs of Abydos. When I do that, I will definitely go ahead and share it with you guys and let me know, let you know how it goes. Um, I'm sure I can get my hands on some of those herbs, I just have to keep looking. So other than herb wines, um, we use herbs and spices in cooking all the time. Um, depending on what region you live in, what kind of cooking you like to do, there may be a set of herbs that you're very familiar with. I mean, for me and where I've been with the way that I cook, I use a lot of cumin and um, turmeric and garlic and basil and parsley and um, salt and pepper, duh. But there is, there are a couple herbs which I don't find myself using as often. Um, one of those being sumac. Um, but when I do cook with it, I get a really interesting flavor that I, I don't even know how I would replicate it with anything else. So what is an herb that you enjoy cooking with that is not as common in your cooking? With that all being said, I think I'm gonna go and try and live my cottagecore dreams. So I'm gonna go make some herbed wine my, for myself and I will let you know how it goes. But until then, um, enjoy wine, enjoy cooking, enjoy spices, and I will see you guys again in two weeks. Cheers. I never would have thought, I swear, they use Riesling. I swear this is Riesling. I don't know what else you could possibly use to get that kind of flavor, it's so distinct.